Hey, Bobby, you're back. You mind helping me out today? Yeah, I need you just to stand in one place for me, all right? Do you mind standing in front of the reference point? Yeah, yeah, right there. You can stop right there, okay? Let's track your data with a position time graph. Huh, you can see that all the data points are above the timeline when you're in front of the reference point. And when you look at the slope of the position time graph, it's at zero. So your velocity is at zero, and since the slope of the velocity time graph is also at zero, your acceleration is also at zero. Fancy that. Okay, Bobby, you mind walking behind the reference point now? Yep, yep, right there. Okay, just stand right there. On your marks, get set, stand. And this time you can see that all the data points are below the time axis. Very good. And if you take a look at the slope of this, it's at zero. And since your velocity is at zero, your acceleration is also at zero. So this tells you something about the DT graph and the VT graph. For the DT graph, anytime the data points are above the time axis, you're in front of the reference point. And if your data points are below the time axis, then you're behind the reference point. And one more thing about the velocity time graph is that by looking at it alone, you have no idea where they started. You only know the direction that they are moving. Okay, Bobby, I want you to walk forwards at a constant velocity. On your marks, get set, go! You can see that on the position time graph, the slope is positive. And if you look at the velocity time graph, its slope is at zero because he's traveling at a constant velocity. Okay, Bobby, I want you to move forwards and through the reference point. So I want you to start from, yeah, right around there. On your marks, get set, go! So this time around, the DT graph looks slightly different, but the VT graph and AT graph look identical. Since Bobby was starting from behind the reference point, that's why the data points are below the time axis. In fact, we can shift the data points around. As long as he's moving forwards at a constant velocity, he will always produce the same exact graph, regardless of where he started his activity. In summary, the VT graph will never tell you where you started, but it will tell you your displacement. Okay, Bobby, I want you to walk backwards now. Yeah, starting from right there. On your marks, get set, go backwards. The DT graph has a negative slope, and the corresponding VT graph has data points below the time axis. For a velocity time graph, as long as the data points are below the time axis, you are moving backwards. Okay, Bobby, I want you to start from rest and then accelerate. The DT graph is a parabola opening upwards. The VT graph starts from zero and it has a positive slope, meaning that this time round you're experiencing a positive acceleration. Now we can shift this curve up and down and the VT and AT graphs will look identical. A shift in the DT graph only has a shift on where you start your activity. In this case, you're starting from in front of the reference point, And in this case, you're starting from behind the reference point. Regardless of where you start, as long as you're accelerating forwards, you will have the same looking VT and AT graph. Okay, Bobby, start from there and accelerate backwards. On your marks, get set, go! The DT graph looks like a curve opening downwards. Since it has a slope of zero at the beginning and the slope becomes more and more negative, that's why the VT graph starts from zero and the values are decreasing. When you take a look at the VT graph, the slope is negative, and that's why the AT graph also has data points that are negative. So in this case, acceleration is negative because you're accelerating in the opposite direction. Okay, Bobby, I want you to move forwards and slow down. Before we plot out the graph, what should the curve look like? That's right, it should look like this. And again, regardless of where he starts, it's going to start off with a positive slope and eventually have a slope of zero. So in this case, he's starting from behind the reference point, moving forwards, and eventually coming to a stop. When you look at the VT data, you'll see that the VT data was initially positive, and eventually the velocity drops down to zero. You'll notice the slope of the VT graph is negative, telling you that you're experiencing a negative acceleration. In fact, whenever you're decelerating, you're actually accelerating in the opposite direction. One last thing about the AT graph, you can see that in both cases, you produce the same exact graph. The area underneath it in AT graph only tells you the change in velocity. It'll never tell you what your starting velocity is, but it'll tell you the slope of the VT graph. Okay, this time around, Bobby, I want you to move backwards 
and decelerate to a stop, think about what the curve should look like. That's right, it should look something like this. Now depending upon where the time axis is, that will just simply tell you where you're going to start. Okay Bobby, I want you to move backwards and eventually come to a stop. Are you ready? On your marks, get set, go! So at first he was moving backwards at a very high negative velocity. Eventually his velocity drops down to zero. And if you look at the AT graph, since the VT graph has a positive slope, your acceleration is positive. Again, whenever you're decelerating, you're always accelerating in the opposite direction. So since Bobby was moving backwards and slowing down, he's accelerating in the positive or in the forwards direction. Okay, Bobby, I want you to jump for joy and produce the corresponding DT, VT, and AT graph. Ready, buddy? On your marks, get set, go. You can see that his velocity was initially positive, and when he reaches the maximum height, he pauses for a brief moment, so the velocity goes to zero. After that, the velocity increases in the negative direction. Now, when you take a look at the VT graph, you can see that there are no breaks at all whatsoever, meaning that the velocity is continuously decreasing, or you're always experiencing negative acceleration whenever you're in free fall. And that's what's happening with our little buddy. The moment that Bobby is off the ground, he is experiencing free fall in the negative direction. All right, so let's summarize all the curves that we've learned today. First, let's take a look at when you have the VT data above the time axis. You'll notice that the slope is at zero, but the velocity is constant, meaning that you're moving forwards at a constant velocity. You'll notice that there's no time axis here because that doesn't really matter. We're just looking at trends right now. So anytime that you have a VT graph where the data points are above zero, but has a slope of zero, you're moving forwards at a constant velocity. In the second case, you can see that all the data points remain the same value, but they're all negative, meaning that you're moving backwards at a constant velocity. In the third case, your initial velocity starts off at zero, and gradually the value increases. In other words, you're accelerating in the positive direction, and you should expect a curve of a parabola opening upwards. In the fourth case, your initial velocity starts at zero, then the values begin to increase, but in the negative direction. That means that you're accelerating backwards. As for the DT curve, it should look like a parabola opening downwards. In the fourth case, you start off with an initial velocity and eventually you reach zero. So in this case, you're moving forwards and you're decelerating. This should look like the left side of a parabola opening downwards. In the last example, you start off with a negative velocity and approach zero. So you're moving backwards really quickly and eventually you come to a stop. This should look like a left-hand side of a parabola opening upwards. Okay, let's do some graph conversion. We'll start off with a VT graph and eventually we want to convert it into a position time graph. So what we need to do is we need to figure out the area underneath each of these tiny little segments. We'll start off with this triangle over here. We see that it has a base of four seconds and a height of three meters per second. Three meters per second times four seconds gives you 12 meters and since this is a triangle, you divide by two, giving you six meters. In the smaller triangle over here, it has a base of two seconds and a height of three meters per second. Three times two gives you six, and divide by two will give you three meters. In this third segment, you can see that we're gonna produce negative area, and that's because the velocity is negative. Negative three times two gives you negative six, and since this is a triangle, Negative six divided by two gives you negative three meters. In this fourth segment, we're also moving backwards. So negative three meters per second times four seconds will give you 12, and half of that is negative six meters. If you pause right here, you'll notice that six plus three minus three minus six gives you zero. So you should expect that by the 12 second mark, you're back to where you started. The fifth triangle looks kind of like the second and third triangle, so we expect it to have an area of three meters. And the last shape is out of a rectangle. So two seconds times three meters per second will give you six meters. And if we add up all these values together, we'll have a final result in displacement of nine meters forwards. Now when you plot out the graph, we're going to assume that you start off from an initial position of zero meters. During the first four seconds of its journey, it would have advanced six meters forwards.
from 4 to 8 seconds, you'll move in an additional 3 meters forwards. So you'll be at the 9 meter position. Between 6 and 8 seconds, you'll notice that your displacement is negative 3 meters. So you'll move back 3 meters. Between 8 and 12 seconds, you would have moved back 6 meters. So 6 minus 6 brings you back to 0, as we mentioned earlier. After that, you advance 3 meters forwards, and then you move at a constant velocity for the final 6 meters. At this point, it's super tempting to play connect the dots. However, if you do this, you're going to arrive to the wrong answer. You got to keep in mind that your velocity is not fixed for the most part. It's continuously changing. So at the beginning of your journey, you were initially started from rest, and your velocity gradually increased up to 3 meters per second. That's why you should expect a parabola opening upwards. Between the 4 and 6 second mark, you're slowing down. You're gradually moving from 3 meters per second down to 0 meters per second. And that's why it will look like a parabola opening downwards. At the 6 second mark, you start off at 0 meters per second and you finish off at negative 3 meters per second. In other words, you're accelerating backwards. From 8 to 12 seconds, you start off at negative 3 meters per second, then negative 2, then negative 1, and you finish off at 0 meters per second. So this is a case where you're moving backwards and decelerating. Next, you start off from 0 meters per second and you increase up to 3 meters per second. And for this final segment, you constantly remain at 3 meters per second. And that's why during this last segment, you're allowed to play connect the dots. Let's summarize some key ideas from page 10. When you measure the slope of a tangent on a dt graph, you're measuring the instantaneous velocity. When you measure the slope of a tangent on a vt graph, you're measuring the instantaneous acceleration. When you find the area underneath a vt graph, it tells you displacement. And remember that displacement means change in position. And when you find out the area underneath the dt graph, first take a look at the units. In the vertical axis, it's in meters. In the horizontal axis, it's in seconds. So meters times seconds gives you meters seconds. And currently, there's no meaning for any unit in meters times seconds. When you determine the area underneath an AT graph, well, that tells you the change in your velocity. And that's it for our summary. For tonight's homework, work on the graphs on page 21, and you'll have a unit test in two classes. All the best. All right, let's go through tonight's homework. You can find out the area of either the big square or the two smaller triangles. In either case, 2 plus 2 will give you 4. So starting from a position of 0, you initially advance 2 units forwards, and then you advance yet another 2 units forwards. After that, you have a triangle of 2 times 2 divided by 2, as it's a triangle, so that works out to 2 units forwards. All the area afterwards is negative area, so you're moving backwards. Initially, you move backwards 1 times 1 divided by 2, which is 1 half, so you're moving back 1 half of a unit. Then you move back a full unit backwards, as is 1 times 1. And yet again, you move half a unit backwards. The area over here is positive area, so 1 times 1 divided by 2 gives you positive 1 unit forwards. And then for the next three seconds, you're moving constantly at one unit per second forwards. You finish off with two times one divided by two, which gives you one. In total, that's two, four, six, eight, eight and a half units forwards. And that is your final position. Again, you should not be playing connect the dots unless if you're traveling at a constant velocity. In our first part, you are moving at a constant velocity so that's why you're allowed to play connect the dots for the first two seconds. After that, however, you're moving at two meters per second, then one meter per second, and you come to a stop. Over the next three seconds, you're moving backwards. Starting from rest, you accelerate backwards. You pull out your ruler as you're traveling backwards at constantly one unit per second backwards, and then you decelerate back to zero. After that, you accelerate forwards, you maintain a constant velocity over the next three seconds. And then you gradually decrease from one meter per second 
back to rest. And there's your curve sketch. You are also responsible for converting a velocity time graph to an acceleration time graph. For the first two seconds, your slope is at zero. So your acceleration is also at zero. Over the next three seconds, you have a slope of negative one, as it's a rise of negative one and a run of one. If you choose to, you can play connect the edges just for clarity's sake, but it's not all that necessary. After that, you have a slope of zero, so your acceleration quickly goes to zero. After that, your acceleration quickly rises to one meter per second over the next two seconds. Is this realistic? No, it's not. But that's why this is just curve sketching. It's an exercise of just knowing what the trends should look like. In real life, there's always gradual acceleration and gradual deceleration, so you should not see sharp edges on the velocity time graph. Over the next three seconds, again, you suddenly drop down to zero meters per second. And during the last segment, you have a slope of negative one half. And that's it for your AT graph. A jerk time graph is measuring the slope of an AT graph. So the slope of acceleration is zero here, then zero, then zero, 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 and finally zero. So your jerk time graph here is not all that interesting. It looks something just like that. Here's the second question in the homework. We start off with a trapezoid, and the trapezoid is comprised of a rectangle and a triangle. The rectangle has an area of four units, and the triangle has an area of two units, giving us a grand total of six units forwards. And that's probably the quickest way of finding out the area for the first segment. As for the second segment, two times one divided by two gives you positive one unit forwards. Over the next four seconds, this is all negative area, so we're all moving backwards. We initially move backwards at one unit backwards, as we have a symmetrical triangle as the first one. We then move backwards at two units per second and another two units per second, and then we only move backwards for just half a unit. We then advance forwards for half a unit, the next little area is that of a trapezoid again. So it's a full rectangle plus a triangle, which adds up to two units forwards. And for the last little area, it looks rather funny, so we have to start estimating the area. That's one, two, over three, so it's pushing roughly four and a half units forwards. So we'll end off somewhere up here. So our final position at the end of the day will be two, four, six, eight, roughly eight and a half meters forwards. Again, do not play connect the dots, instead play connect the trends. We'll notice our initial velocity is not at zero, so it should not be the vertex of a parabola. Instead, it should have a positive slope of one and continue to increase. There's suddenly a sharp drop down to a velocity of zero meters per second. So that should be the vertex of this next opening downwards parabola, at least up to this point over here. Because from there and beyond for a bit, we have a slope of zero on the velocity time graph, meaning that the object is experiencing uniform motion, AKA moving at a constant velocity. It then moves backwards and comes to a stop, positive area, so it accelerates forwards, still moving forwards and gradually increasing. And then we finish off with three meters per second, two meters per second, one meter per second, down to a stop. So three meters per second, two meters per second, one meter per second, stop. And that's it for our second curve. As for the corresponding acceleration, we can see that the first segment has a rise of one and a run of four. So it has a slope of one quarter. The next portion has a run of one and a rise of negative two. So it has a slope of negative two over the next two seconds. The slope suddenly drops down to zero. Then we have a slope of positive one for the next two seconds. Then a slope of positive two for the next second. And for the last part, if we draw tangents, we start off with a tangent of zero, then negative one, then probably around negative two-ish. So we start off at zero and our values increase in the negative direction, like so.
Optionally, if you really want to play connect the lines, you can, but that's just for clarity. Again, in real life, we shouldn't expect sudden changes in acceleration. It should be gradual. For the last part of jerk, first segment has a slope of zero, then zero, 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 and the last part gets interesting because we have a slope of negative one. And that's what the jerk time graph will look like. Slope of zero right up to around this point over here, then we have a slope of negative one for the next two seconds. And that's it. As for grade 11s, you're not responsible for plotting out jerk time graphs, but it's nice to know that such things exist. Again, the slope of an acceleration time graph creates a jerk time graph. And if you really wanted to, the slope of a jerk time graph gives you a snap time graph. And the slope of a snap time graph gives you a crackle time graph. And you've probably guessed it, the slope of a crack time graph gives you pop time graph. That's it for now. Till our next episode together.